Hello and welcome. I'm Catherine Banwell, your host for today's program. Today, we're going to discuss prostate cancer research advances and the role of clinical trials in moving treatment developments forward. Before we get into the discussion, please remember that this program is not a substitute for seeking medical advice. Please refer to your healthcare team about what might be best for you. Well, let's meet our guest today. Joining me is Dr. Samit Sabuti. Dr. Sabuti, thanks for being with us. Would you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Sumit Sabuti. I'm an associate professor in the GU Medical Oncology Department at MD Anderson Cancer Center, and I exclusively uh, treat patients with advanced prostate cancer, and I've been doing it for about a decade. Thank you. I'd like to begin with an update on prostate cancer research. Would you walk us through the newer classes of treatments that are showing promise? Yeah, in clinical trials, there are classes of drugs known as androgen receptor degraders, And so the androgen receptor is a protein that basically is the mouth of the prostate cancer. That's how I'd like to describe it. And it actually um, allows testosterone, which is the food, to be eaten by the mouth. And and it actually helps the cancer grow. And what what these drugs do is they actually degrade or break down the mouth of the cancer, and therefore it starves the cancer to death. That's actually the concept. And they seem to be showing some exciting activity in clinical trials, especially in those patients who are resistant to the second generation hormonal drugs that you may have heard of already, such as enzalutamide, apalutamide, and darolutamide. So so I think this is uh, something that we're looking forward to seeing more uh, data on. Another class of drugs are antigen, sorry, antibody drug conjugates or ADCs. And these are what I think of as heat seeking missiles. So, what it does is the one part of the drug actually recognizes the cancer, and the other part of the drug actually has a payload that sort of releases a bomb or some sort of like chemotherapy type agent right where the cancer is located and and kills the cancer in that way. And we're seeing some great clinical activity in prostate cancer with this class of drugs. And then the final one is uh, bispecifics and in particular T-cell bispecifics. So T-cells are part of the immune system that actually help kill the cancer. And unfortunately, prostate cancer, like some other cancers like pancreatic and glioblastoma, have few T-cells inside it. And therefore, a lot of the immunotherapies that many people have heard about, such as Yervoy and Keytruda, they just haven't, they're not very responsive in patients with prostate cancer. And it's because there's few T cells in prostate cancer. What the T cell bispecifics do is they actually have one part of the drug that actually recognizes the cancer and the other part that recognizes T cells. So like a bulldozer, it brings T cells right into the the prostate cancer and and helps kill the cancer that way. Mm. Now, there are some inhibitors as well. Is that correct? Yeah. So the immune checkpoint inhibitors have been around for a while. uh, And and basically, they have been in combination, they seem to be more effective in prostate cancer. But when given alone as monotherapy, they're less effective. Okay. Are these treatments specifically for patients with advanced prostate cancer? All of them are actually in trials in patients with advanced prostate cancer. And I defined advanced prostate cancer as either having metastatic disease, meaning the cancer has spread to other parts of the body outside of the prostate. Examples include lymph node, the bone, the lung, the liver. And, uh, but there are so few trials in patients with locally advanced prostate cancer. What I mean by that is they have a uh, high grade prostate cancer, but it's local or it's just in the regional lymph nodes. And some of these trials are being, um, or some, some of these classes of drugs are being evaluated in that setting as well. Let's shift to talk about your research. What are you excited about right now? So I've actually, uh, my research focuses on immune checkpoint therapies, which are the inhibitors that you were uh, referring to, and understanding how to make them work better in prostate cancer. And we're finding out that in prostate cancer, there's actually a good, there's about 20 to 25% of patients that appear to respond to this type of treatment. But these are patients that don't have a lot of bone metastases. 
And so, and they're also, these immune checkpoint inhibitors are given in combination. So they're not given alone, they're given with either uh, a combination of anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 uh, or, or, or some, some other form of that. Mm -hmm. Prostate cancer research really can only move forward through clinical trials and patient participation in those trials. Can you briefly explain what a trial is for people who may not be familiar with the term? Yeah, that's a great question. It's uh, my, my, my own father uh, has prostate cancer, and then he, he had the same exact question when he started his journey in that. And uh, so what I explained to him is that clinical trials are experiments. The experiments are done in our patients. They're drugs that are thought to mechanistically kill the cancer cell or at least change the environment around the cancer cell to um, to help uh, help people live longer, and and but these drugs were actually tested in mouse models or in tissue models, and we don't know if they actually work in patients. And so, in clinical trials, we're actually testing whether these drugs are safe and whether they're efficacious or beneficial to our patients. So I want to be very clear, when patients go on clinical trials, we don't know if it's going to work on them. And, uh, and that's something that they, they should know that they're, they're showing a lot of courage and risk in, um, in joining these trials. But the other point I want to make is that every standard of care drug that is out there actually went through the clinical trial process. Uh, and they were approved because they showed benefit in a, in a group of patients. Yeah. Well, how can a prostate cancer patient benefit from participating in a trial? Yeah, so one of the key benefits is that you get access to drugs that may actually uh, prolong your life or even cure you uh, and that you wouldn't have access to in, in trials. And, and so some of my patients, unfortunately, they've exhausted uh, all, the, uh, all the standard of care choices that are out there. And the trial is the only option left versus um, leaving it up to, to natural causes of, uh, um, of demise from prostate cancer. And so clinical trials give uh, other opportunities to potentially live longer and have a great quality of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they could offer some hope. They, they definitely, as far as I'm concerned, yes. And I actually, with my patients, I try not to waste, uh, wait, sorry, I try not to wait till the, um, while they've exhausted all the treatments to start them on clinical trials, because I feel like we may be able to save some of these treatments in our back pocket for when they're too exhausted to be coming to our clinic so often. And, and so I like to actually try to get them enrolled in clinical trials um, early on in their journey with prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. I'd like to define some clinical trial terminology to help patients mm -hmm. further understand the process. Let's start with the phases. What occurs during each phase? Yeah, so great question. Phase one is the safety phase. So all we're trying to do is find the right dose of the drug that is actually safe to give in the patients. And we call it, we're looking for the maximum tolerated dose. And once we find that dose, then we use that dose to go to the phase two of the trial. And phase two trials are looking at efficacy. So looking to see whether the trial has, um, uh, is giving you any clinical benefit, meaning the cancer shrinking or even disappearing. And then, oh, and then the third phase uh, is uh, phase three, where you're testing the, the current drug, the experimental drug, to either standard of care or to placebo to see whether or not you get uh, a benefit, either a progression-free survival benefit or overall survival benefit. And so those are the three phases of clinical trials. Okay. What are the different types of clinical trials? So there are controlled trials. Actually, I should say, I should back up. So there's open label trials where everyone that enrolls in a trial will get the drug, that, the experimental drug. So, uh, and so there is no control arms in these trials. 
Then there's the control trials where you can either get the drug or you may get a uh, placebo or standard of care drug. And, and in these trials, there are some trials that allow for crossover, meaning that if you're in the placebo or standard of care arm, if your cancer progresses, you, you can actually cross over and get the experimental drug. But I just want to be clear that not all clinical trials have crossover. And if you're in a control trial, I think that's an important question to ask your doctors about that. But the reason why we do the control trials is that we've learned that using historical controls, for example, we're doing a lot of uh, combination studies with chemotherapy, such as docetaxel, which was FDA approved in 2004. So if we're using historical data from almost 20 years ago, it's not the same thing as our patients that are being treated with docetaxel now because the treatment landscape has changed so much and our patients have changed so much. And so for that reason, control trials give us a better sense of how effective this experimental uh, drug is doing as opposed to comparing it to um, an historical perspective. What other types of clinical trials are available? So there are a few other options. So we talked about open label where everyone's guaranteed to get the drug. We talked about uh, a controlled study where you will either get one drug or the uh, or another. And um, another type is a randomized trial where a computer decides whether or not you're going to actually get one drug versus another. It's not your doctor, because a lot of people think that I'm making that decision, and I'm not. It's actually a random computer. And some trials have a one-to-one ratio, meaning a 50% chance that you'll get this, the experimental drug versus the control drug. But other drugs, other trials have a one to two ratio or a one to three ratio. So that's something that, again, you have to ask the uh, your, your physician of how these trials are being randomized. Well, in a randomized clinical trial, the patient isn't going to know what drug they're being given. That's true. Actually, that's, that's not true. That's oh, not true. Not. So it's in the double. So, that, so you bring up a great question. So there is a double blind randomized con- uh, clinical trial where not only the patient doesn't know, but even the physicians and the nurses, no one um, except for the pharmaceutical company that's running the trial actually knows uh, who's, uh, who's actually um, getting which drug. And it's only towards the end of the trial that we unblind and then we share that information. Well, the pharmaceutical company first shares it with the medical team, who then shares it with the patient. Oh, I see. Okay. Are there other common clinical trial terms that you think patients should know about and understand? I think to, for now, those are there are definitely the important. Others, but I think to me, those are the most important. And I yeah. think that sometimes too much information can bog us down. Yeah. Well, speaking of information, there is a lot out there, um, some of which may not be very reliable, and that could lead many patients to having misconceptions about clinical trials. Let's walk through a few common concerns we've heard from our community about trials. One frequent question is, will I receive a placebo instead of a real treatment? And first, I'd like you to define placebo, and should this be a concern for patients? Right. So placebo is a drug that looks similar to the, the experimental drugs. For example, if it's if the experimental drug is a blue pill, then the placebo will be a, a blue pill, but it will be a pill that should have no, bio, no known biological activity. If the experimental drug is given in intravenously and you get it in a liquid bag, then the placebo will also come in a liquid bag. So it'll look the same. And that's why both the uh, the medical team as well as the patients or their families will not know which drug the patients have received, meaning the experimental drug or the placebo. And But the placebos are meant to not have any biological activity. Okay, so it shouldn't be a concern to patients then. 
It, well, the concern that most of my patients share with me when they hear about placebo-controlled trials is, well, if I'm not going to get the experimental drug, why should I do this? I mean, what benefit does it have for me? And so I tell them that one of the benefits is that we are watching you very carefully. Because even if you're not, because we don't know sometimes which drug you're getting, but in, in con some controlled trials, like a randomized controlled trial, we will know because I'm not blinded. If you're in the arm that's only getting chemotherapy, well, you know you're not getting an oral pill. So it's very clear to the patient what, what they're getting. But, um, but if they're getting an oral pill that's a placebo, we're watching them very carefully. We're watching the patients very carefully in these uh, placebo-controlled trials. And, and they're coming in often so that we're not going to miss any um, devastating things happening from the cancer. In fact, we'll pick it up earlier than if they were just getting a standard of care outside of a trial. And for that reason, I tell my patients, don't be worried. And I always make sure that I have a backup plan. So the backup plan is either they're going to cross over, meaning the trial allows for them to cross over to get the experimental drug, or I have another trial that I know that they will qualify for. Or the third alternative is that I actually have a standard of care drug that I'm ready to give them the second I have it so that they don't have to have those concerns. Yeah, uh, that's really great information to have. Patients also often have questions about safety. So what are the risks of clinical trial participation? Yeah, so safety is a, is a major issue, especially uh, more in the phase one, where we may not know what the, uh, the phase one trials, if you remember, are the trials where we're dose escalating, meaning we, we start off with a small cohort of patients, maybe three to five patients, and we give one dose of the drug, we see if it's safe, if it's safe, then we go to the next dosing level and we just keep going until we find uh, a dose that may be too toxic or too unsafe for our patient. So in the phase one, we have less information, especially in the first in human drugs. Uh, and, and so that, that, that's, but in those cases, we are watching you carefully. So to make sure that nothing uh, bad happens to you. But the problem with those trials, it requires a lot of time at the institution or with your doctor. And the reason for that, for example, I'm doing a bi-specific trial where we have to keep the patients inside the hospital for eight days, purely for safety reasons. They're not getting the drug for all eight days, but we're just keeping them under observation. So in case anything bad happens, we're ready to react because we know that if something bad happens at their home in that first eight days, they, they could actually risk their lives. And so, so, so in those cases, some trials, if we're concerned about safety, you'll be spending more time in the doctor's office or in a hospital uh, being evaluated. So that's, that's the one negative. But sometimes the, um, the trials that can be more exhausting as far as uh, the amount of time it takes you away from your home and family are the ones that have the most reward. What protocols are in place to protect patients? Yeah, so the patients are always, so when they sign up for a protocol, we are instructed to, to give them our best information. So let's say it's a first in human drug. Well, usually first in human drugs are, taste, uh, are tested in uh, other mammals, such as monkeys, and we look for toxicities there and we have signs of what's going to happen. Sometimes a first in human drug is part of a class of drugs, like I said, talked to you about T-cell bispecifics. Well, there's several T-cell bispecifics out there, and we've learned that this class of drugs has a unique set of side effects that they all tend to have. Some have it more and some have it less. But when we're discussing this with you or the patient, we are actually gonna go through each and 
all of these side effects. Now, me personally, my patients that go on my trials, they all get my cell phone number. So they have 24-7 access to me because I know they're taking a risk and it's a lot of courage to go on these trials and it's scary. And I want to make sure they don't feel like they're ever alone. Another common concern we hear is that a clinical trial is only considered when there are no other treatment options available for a patient. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, my colleagues in the field that feel that way. And I know a lot of patients and misconceptions are also that way. And it's partly because of Hollywood and, and movies and TV shows that we watch. But, but I think that many people... Uh, and, and especially the, in the medical field, think of clinical trials as the last resort. And I actually disagree with that. I think that uh, I like to actually start my patients with one or two standard of care treatments, but after that, really start putting clinical trials in between. And we have to remember that I that there's not always a clinical trial available that the patient actually uh, meets the criteria for. So it's always disheartening in clinic when I meet someone for the very first time who was referred to me because they exhausted everything and we just don't have any clinical trials available or they're so weak from the cancer and all the prior treatments that they don't qualify for a clinical trial. And then I really don't have anything else to give them. So my personal approach is to try to put clinical trials in between and always have something in my back pocket so that if they get a bit exhausted or they just, um, they want to uh, spend more time with friends and family, they can, they can get the standard of care treatment. Yeah. If a patient is interested in participating in a trial, what's the best way to find out which trials might be available for them and right for them? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think number one is always ask your uh, your oncologist, and 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 they're they're a great resource. But also there's uh, there's websites. So for different uh, types of cancers, so for example, I do prostate cancer. So the Prostate Cancer Foundation or PCF.org is a wonderful resource that will give you where uh, some list of cutting edge trials. In addition, there's um, the government has the clinicaltrials.gov, or and that's where you can actually type in your cancer type and 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 different criteria, and and you'll get a list of trials. That's good to know. What questions should patients ask their healthcare team when considering joining a trial? Would I would, I would ask them, would you do it yourself if you were in my situation? I think there that's a. I think that's a very important thing to ask. Are there barriers that interfere with, with patients' access to clinical trials? I mean, I think you touched on this, but but maybe yeah. you have anything to add? Yeah, yeah. so the tra- travel can be a major barrier. And, uh, and that's something that uh, the pharmaceutical industry understands. And therefore, some of the trials, especially the multi-center trials, actually allow for uh, travel costs. That, that sometimes includes flights, driving, hotels, food. So that's something that's important to ask. Because uh, sometimes uh, when we're thinking about clinical trials, we're so anxious in the doctor's office. And then it's not until we go back home when we're trying to figure out how do we get the resources to come so frequently, you'll find out that sometimes travel costs. The other thing is uh, underrepresented minorities are, are, are something that we've been doing a relatively poor job uh, recruiting into our clinical trials. Part of that is just from history that um, we didn't have the safety rules in place that we do now. Um, and, and, and underrepresented minorities were affected negatively in some of the earlier trials. And, and the other thing is just the resources of getting to and from um, their homes to, to, the, um, to, to our cancer site uh, as often as they need to, because they may be, they may be the um, sole breadwinner in their homes and things like that. So there, there are there are resources to try to help uh, do this, but I still think we have to do a better job. Yeah. Can trials be coordinated between a local doc and uh, the institution? Yeah, so most trials 
cannot, most, but there are some that can. So if it's a standard of care treatment, sometimes uh, we can have the safety visits done with the local doctors. But every time they're going to get the treatment, they have to come see us at the, um, at the, um, at the institution that is actually running the trial. But most of the time, what I tell all my patients is I want them to have a local doctor because if there's something that happens in the middle of the night, I want to be able to say, you're going to go to this emergency room where this doctor works. And then when they go there, as soon as they get admitted into the emergency room center, I talk to the ER doctor and I say, this is what I want to be done. These are how these drugs work because they're not going to know what these experimental drugs are. They're not available in the community. So I just think it's important to have communication, especially for our patients that are out of state or I live um MD Anderson's in Houston, Texas, and Texas is so big that a lot of my patients live six to eight hours away, and they're still in Texas. Oh, so. wow. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on what could be done to overcome the barriers that some patients are experiencing? And are there resources available? Yeah, so there are. So the pharmaceutical companies are are putting in more financial resources as well as uh, diversity resources. And when I say diversity resources, out outreach programs to just make sure that the communities that are underserved are hearing about the clinical trials, because if you don't hear about it, you're never going to join it. So one thing is just knowledge. And then number two, we're trying to create financial resources so that, for example, if, uh, there's, um, there's angel flights as one example where they will they'll pay for the flight for you and, and they'll put you on a, a maybe a charter plane or something or a smaller plane to um, to defray the cost of of um, traveling by air. So th there are things out there, but we still need a lot more. Mm -hmm. But one thing patients could do is talk to their healthcare team about what resources are available for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Before we end the program, Dr. Sabuti, I'd like to get your final thoughts. What message do you want to leave the audience with related to clinical trial participation? First of all, thank you for even thinking about it. Uh, I, I, that's that's a, that's a one big step. And for those of you who actually um, take the next step and actually join a clinical trial, again, thank you for being so so brave. Uh, it's a, I, I think it's a gift that you're giving to to your fellow uh, cancer, um, can, um, it's a gift that you're giving to your other fellow um, patients with, with cancer. And it's also a gift that you're giving to the scientific and medical community because we, we are learning um, by your participation in the trial. And I want you to know um, whether the trial works for you or does not work for you, Regardless, we're going to learn something that's going to help change uh, uh, outcomes in, uh, in your cancer. Yeah. Dr. Sabuti, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. And thank you to all of our partners. To learn more about prostate cancer and to access tools to help you become a proactive patient, visit PowerfulPatients.org. I'm Catherine Banwell. Thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.